Thank you guys for joining me. I have managed to get Leslie. Hey, Leslie. Can you see me? I'm just... I'm just about to add you into the live. So if you just wait there, I will send you the thing and then you can just, I can't see you. The camera, I think is off. Still can't see you. Nope. Let me lock this off and do it again So I'll wait for her to accept and we can get into it. Okay. Hey. Hi. Hi. Thank How are you? you so much for joining me today. I know it has been a bit of misunderstandings, but thank you for your time. No, thank you. It happens a lot because I'm on mountain time. It gets confusing. So no worries. I'm glad we connected. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for all our viewers um, who are who are just tuning in, um, this is the Leslie um, Wagner Wilson, and she is one of the survivors from the Jonestown massacre. Um, so she'll be here and we're literally going to have a chit chat. So thank you so much for for building the courage to be us, be here and even grace us with your presence today. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, Without further ado, um, let us get into it. Um, can you please just let us and our Africa X5 family know what it has taken for you to actually be able to speak about this particular time in your life? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, this has been, I think, 43 years. Um, this uh, tragedy occurred on November 18th, 1978. I was 21. It took almost 20 years for me to actually be able to speak about it because of the, just the whole situation was, we had a stigma upon us. Here's um, the majority of black uh, folks, African-Americans, majority women who died in a, in, a, in, a, in a jungle. So of course the news articles were, you know, very um, negative and portraying us as murderers. So basically I went underground for 20 years. I changed my name, I didn't speak about it until, 20, about 20 years ago. And so part of my healing was to be able to talk about it. And because it was so traumatic and because we really don't encourage mental health, um, you know, services, um, I just suffered internally. I suffered quietly. And finally I said, you know, I need to speak out. I wrote the book, Slave Your Faith. That was in 2009. And this is, this is the journey. Wow. It has, you know, I have to commend you and applaud you on your journey because I'm from the UK and I wasn't, you know, we don't hear too many stories of what actually goes on mm -hmm. on the other side of the world. So when I did, when the opportunity did come for me to actually speak with you, I had to do a bit of research and I broke down. So for you to be here today to actually, you know, just go over it. I commend you and, you know, I, I raise you up there in, in, in a sense. Thank you. In a sense. So um, the, the, the first question I did want to ask you was how did you, um, how did you become known with the, with the People's Temple? What was your life like before People's mm -hmm. Temple? I had an incredible childhood. I did. Um, my father that raised me was white. He adopted my sister and I in the early 60s. And so even though we were from California, it was, it was not as progressive. You know, my dad was, his job was threatened if he married this black woman. Um, he said, fire me. He was a top salesman at his company. He kept his job. 
but I had a great childhood. I grew up in an upper middle class family, you know, summer camps, uh, camping trips every summer. We were a very close knit family until my family divorced, my parents divorced. So my mother was always able to stay at home with us. So she chose to do that by moving to a college town called Santa Rosa, California. And she opened up a residential care home for mentally ill patients. And my sister, Michelle, you know, God rest her soul, she passed in Jonestown, got involved in drugs. Remember, this is during the Vietnam War and the civil rights, and she found her way into drugs. And my mother was desperate for help. And a friend of hers who also had a, a residential care home said, oh, I know a place called People's Temple. They have this great drug rehab program for the youth. So that's how we got recruited, because people don't join cults, they're recruited. We traveled there for about a year, and then we finally made the move when I was 13. Wow. So that's how, that's, how, that's how we became involved. So it's obviously, you know, they, it's not that they would prey on, you know, certain weaknesses that were displayed as maybe a family, and the, and the weakness was the fact that your parents had decided to to kind of split and with there, your mom was then a single parent, I believe. Ex absolutely, she a was. Parent, obviously dealing with your sister who, who had a problem. Mm -hmm. So with that, would you say that that is kind of the, with, was that the way they kind of reeled people in? The services were, was how they wrote, you know, how they brought people in. Because remember, um, we were in a very turbulent time and there were still, you know, black, black people were still disenfranchised. Um, there was a lack of jobs. We we're still struggling trying to get equality as we still are. Yeah. And so, but the services that People's Temple offered were services for legal aid, for, you know, you never went hungry. Whatever you needed, they provided. And it was this very inclusive community, although the majority was black, um, mm -hmm. that felt as if it was a family. And so he provided a safety net when there really was none. But also, you know, I have to wonder, I still don't know why my mother joined because my mother was a successful business owner. You know, so what, so even though the, even though there was a drug rehab program, what made her really stay after what the things that we witnessed early on were not, were not normal, you see? So people compromised a lot, but people felt as if they, they had a place, they had a safe place. And that's what Jim, provided or that was his you know his I say he had a long con right but that's what he portrayed is, I care for you you don't have to go hungry we have a place for you you know here's this interracial community which by the way the majority were black right so it wasn't that interracial yeah and so that's what, that's what brought people in so when, when so when people are seeking when they're seeking that's a, that's a good that's the opportunity for people to, to prey on them Mm. So was there actually any kind of scriptures being read? Was there any kind of teachings from the Bible being conducted? Because I can hear that he was able to do things for people, but was he actually preaching as well? No, no you know, no, there was no, my grandparents were devout Baptists, a deacon and a deaconess, right? My mother was on the fence. My dad was an atheist, although he didn't stop us from going to church. Mm -hmm. So he preached scripture. He was able to incorporate scripture for those that needed it. Because in People's Temple, you had the revolutionary, you had the atheist, you had, um, you know, uh, gay folks, you had uh, um, people that were just, um, you know, older people. But what, so, he, so there was never any, there was never Bible study, right? Mm -hmm. And there was never, you know, weekly prayer meetings, Bible study, none of that. People's Temple was created under the Disciples of Christ because it legitimized the fact that, you know, it was the church when it really was not. Because that was kind of the forefront message that people were getting, that this was a church. And, you know, with that being said, obviously you said he offered different kind of ways. He made people feel welcomed and he did things for people. But the forefront of the message was that these people were going to church. This was a church community. Um, so it, it just kind of, it made me kind of think, obviously you said now that there were minimal teachings and minimal preachings going on, but it made me kind of think that if this man was using church as a forefront and he had these people following, it couldn't have just been church alone that these people 
were following. There must have been something else that he was he was right. doing to keep them there because right. you guys were all educated. Like you said, your mum was a business owner. So it was just literally realizing or understanding why people followed him. Right. Well, he would preach God is love. You know, he would say God is love. But the majority, there was a lot of elderly people. There were a lot of people that were from the church, a normal church, but they weren't welcomed. You know, we had, we had ex-prostitutes, we had drug addicts, we had pimps, we had, you know, homosexuals, lesbians. So he embraced people that, were, that couldn't be embraced anywhere else. You can come as you are in People's Temple. You didn't have to have your hat on or your suit on or you could come as you are. So it was welcoming. But what really, what really brought people in that were believers was the healing, which I didn't know was fake until, I, until after Jonestown. So the healings is what made people stay. A lot of people stay. I know it was just I know you obviously said that you had attended with your you mentioned your mom but what other family members joined you um along to this this fellowship or or, or community in a sense my beautiful baby brother Mark who was 16 when he passed he 16 when he died in Jonestown um my niece um Danielle who was five when she she died in Jonestown <laughs> Um, and then I had a I had a nephew, Duran, who was one and a half. He passed in Jonestown or murdered in Jonestown. And so basically it was not it was it was four of us in the beginning. Okay. And then of course, as years you know came on, I had my son Jakari, so that was another child that was in the church. Um, but everyone joined except for my father, because my father had no interest in it, you know. We were still able to spend time with him if we wanted to, but he 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 had no interest in, in people's temple mm. so so basically your, your your whole family and was that the case with most of the families there did you find that it was say the parents and then the children the mm -hmm. grandchildren was that the case in, in 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 most of everybody's situations in many cases um the, there there would be entire families that came in that's true yes that was not unusual at all wow. it's 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 mad because no it's not mad but it's just it's just mind blowing to to hear that you know entire lines were were wiped out and obviously you you survived um which is which is a blessing you and your son survived how how was his father how were you guys as as a couple as a family in a sense we were fine in the beginning. I married him when I was 18 and I had Jakari when I was 18 and then we, we kind of separated. Um, we were back together in Jonestown. Of course, Joe was apparently one of the assassins of the congressman. So he had, he was a man that was kind of on the ins and outs, you know, and then he became more dedicated and I started stepping back because I started noticing things. So our marriage was basically everything, everything was surrounded by the church. Every, the, the church, or people's temple was the center of our lives. You know, um, what happened to him in the end, he, you know, he changed. He changed. And, and how, I only to ask, obviously, you managed to get away. Would, do you mind telling us how you managed to get away or what even led for you to even be able to escape, mm -hmm. in a sense? Mm -hmm. Well, they took Jakari as a ploy to get me to come to Jonestown because I had one foot in and one foot out. And so my son, because I was so brainwashed, I thought my son will be, will be better off without me. So when Jim Jones asked, you know, my husband, he wants Jakari to go with him when Jim made his exodus out of the U S then my husband agreed. And so did I, because I didn't think I was a good mother. I didn't think I was a good socialist, you know? So I said, sure. So I was stuck in an apartment I, and I received a phone call. I had no intention on going to Jonestown. And, the call, and I had this thought in my head, I call it the spirit of God that said, if you don't go now, you'll never see your son again. So I said, yes, I'll go. So when I went to Jonestown, I was open to being, redeeming myself and to becoming a good socialist, a better mother, a better wife. And it was fine at first. There was food, you know, we had... You know, I was glad I went to summer camp because we had outhouses, you know, um, and and 
it was a little primitive in some ways, but I was proud of what people, what our community built, this whole community in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. So I felt proud of that and I was excited. And I was supposed to be going to medical school in Cuba. I worked very closely with the doctor. I was being trained to do, you know, exams. And then Marceline, Jim's wife, came to me one day and she said with one of my uh, schoolmates, and she said, um, who was white, and she said, we're going to take you out of the, of the medical office and we're going to put you in the field for two more days. And I said, why? And she said, well, because she burned in the sun. And I said, well, I burned too. And of course, I got, you know, reprimanded for that. But again, you know, and it, it sounds, it'll sound funny to some people. I never noticed race until I went to People's Temple. There was no color discussed in my family. I didn't know my dad was white. I knew he, I knew he was light. It was never a conversation. Yeah. And so I didn't notice it until that moment. And I looked around and I said, everyone in leadership is white. Now I have this recognition when I'm, you know, how many miles away from the United States and stuck in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. But I started noticing things. I started noticing that people depend on, depend upon who they were. were not getting the medical care that they needed maybe because they were a threat. Uh, the food became, became, you know, more scarce. We were working six days a week, you know, 12 hour days. Um, our children were not, there was no talk of the future, none. And Jim became, get, he became just, just crazier and crazier, right? And so my first instinct was to get to the U.S. Embassy to try to get someone, call my dad and have my dad come get us. And so I faked a first, my first escape attempt was to hide my glasses um, so I can go to Georgetown, the capital, and try to connect with someone to, to try to tell someone what's happening to get my dad. Yeah. Well, I went, but I didn't have my son with me. And I didn't feel, Jim told, Jim said that everybody knew about it. And if we escaped, we'd be arrested. And remember, we didn't know anything because we were, we were in this, in this community with no contact to the outside world. Letters were being read. Some folks didn't get letters. Some folks, some letters didn't go out. So we're totally isolated. And so I scratched the plan. I came back into Doomstown. And then I just prayed one night. I just said, you know, God, please, I need, this has to be my last year here. This has to be our last year here. And that came upon a friend I met, and there was so much paranoia. You couldn't trust anyone, not even your own family, basically. And so I met a woman who I had known in, in the States. She worked in the pharmacy department. Her name is Diane Louie. And she said, you know, my boyfriend's trying to find a way out. And I said, well, I want to go. Well, I was still married to Joe Wilson, who was still insecurity, et cetera. Okay. And so what they would do is they would plant people inside different groups, Right, you had your mini clicks, your group, and then they would they would go tell what they heard. Right, so that so that was was almost was gone, and so I said, well, I want to go, and she says, well, you have to be voted in, and I said, I'm taking Jakari, so I'm not going to risk, you know, just please. Yeah. She came back a while later, and she said, you're voted in, but you won't know who's going. I said, okay. So I didn't ask any questions for two, three weeks. I didn't mention it because I didn't want them to think I was just. Um, you know, um, snitching on them or telling on them or, or you know, a plant until uh, Congressman Ryan came and um, Diane came to me. She said, we're leaving, we're leaving tonight. And my plan was to get out and come back and get my family, go get my father and come back and get at least my brother who, who may or may not wanted to stay. I didn't know. And my sister who I'm sure wanted to leave. Um, and so her boyfriend, Richard, that night, he said, we're going to meet, you know, we're not leaving tonight. We're going to meet at the kitchen the next day. And that was November 18th, uh, the day of the tragedy. And we met at the kitchen. Someone wanted, someone said, your sister's looking for you. I couldn't go to her. I couldn't go. And it took me years to overcome that guilt, whether or not she thought I knew and left them. But this group had, and when I saw who was in the group, I was, I was flabbergasted because these are people I never thought were unhappy because you didn't show it. Yeah. And so they trusted me. They literally put their, their lives in my hands, right? And so I couldn't go to my sister. I couldn't take the risk that it would be delayed or tell, or I just couldn't. 
And so we continue, we started walking out in broad daylight, you know, up this hill and um, saw, where we were totally exposed. Sorry? Nobody saw you guys when you guys left. I'm I said we had a veil over us. No one looked up to see us climbing this hill. We were totally exposed. I had Jakari on a sheet on my back. Diane had given the children Valium and Kool-Aid. Actually, it was, you know, not Kool-Aid, but the other, um, to calm them down. We managed to get out. We got lost. We were so close to the guard shack, we could hear them talk. The whole, I never asked what the plan was. I never did. The plan was to go to Port Kaituma where the, air, where, the where the planes were. And I just said, I can't go, find me. And, and it, you know, kill me. And we ended up walking the 30 odd miles to Matthews Ridge and the rest is basically history. Um, we had a report that morning that 500 were dead and 500 had ran into the jungle. And I just pray, please, please let somebody, let somebody in my family, you know, come through. For years, I looked for them, you know, mentally. And so it was hard to get, I'm not over it. I'm, I'm good, but it was, I lost, I lost them all in one, in one day, in one moment, my entire family. I'm sorry for your loss, honestly. I'm sorry for your loss because I can't imagine what you would have gone through and um, how you've been able to get over your survivor's guilt um, if you have. Um, if you haven't, it's more more than understandable. But man, you've had it. You've had it quite quite tough, and not many are here today to kind of live to. Sorry, sorry, oh, I wasn't going to do it, but um, you know, not many are here to um, actually tell their story and to educate others going forward. So I commend you solely on that um that's that's god that's all god <laughs> and that's the and i'm so glad that you're that you're showing this because we lost generations we lost entire bloodline you see and people compromise too much and i think it's so important now we we are in a we are in a incredible time you know i never thought i'd see it um but I'm blessed to be here. I'm blessed to share the story. Um, and that, you know, I just continue to try to try to inspire people. Thank you. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Um, I did want to say, like, um, are you religious now at all at the minute? Or has this kind mm -hmm. of experience kind of deterred you from religion as a whole? Or do you still hold God dearly? That's a good question because in the beginning I couldn't walk into a church. I was so suspicious. Every time I walked into a church, I would look around, look at the pastor. I was third, I was looking for something because I wasn't ready. And it took me years to be able to, you know, I was I practiced Islam for a while. I, I looked into Buddhism, searching, and so I came back to what I know, which is you know, a, which which is a Christian walk, and um, I believe that God loves everyone. And sometimes I hear other stories, but I think God is love. And so, yes, I finally found my way. It took a long time. That that indoctrination at that age was so intense. And because I didn't have any kind of decompression, no no help to kind of to to, to muddle through this world that I found myself in, it was a difficult, difficult struggle. But I've been blessed, and I, I thank God. I, I believe, you know, I am, a, I am a, I am a walk. You know, I am Jesus, my Savior. I'm, I'm happy. I'm really happy. I'm happy. I'm happy that you're happy as well, and you know, you're finally getting to a place where you're at peace with yourself. Um, so, achievements and commitment to you all the time and forevermore. Um, in a sense where we can help people going forward, are there any kind of signs that people could look out for um, going in the long run? Because, you know, you won't know until put in that situation, but are there things that we could possibly tell our viewers or our followers going forward? You know, if they are religious, these are the kind of things mm -hmm. to kind of look out for when it comes to putting your trust in, in one person. Right. 
I think that's, and it's not just religion because there's a cult mentality. We're, we're in a cult mentality right now with Trump, right? That's a cult mentality. Um, but I think what people need to look out for, the, the first signs are isolation. If so, if you're in a group, I don't care if it's network marketing, I don't care if it's yoga. If you're in a group where they start tell, advising you not to communicate with family members or friends or other people that don't believe, then you need to be concerned. Because if you want, you know, that's, that's the start of control, right? That's the start of control. And so I give an example of uh, a person, and it's peer pressure, because I saw things in people's temple that I, I questioned at an early age, but I looked around and everybody else, act, it seemed like it wasn't bothering them. So guess what I said? It must, it must be me. It must be me. And so we have to be careful, even friends. Your heart, I think, I think our hearts tell us a lot, right? I say, follow your spirit. I say, follow your God sin, because that nudge, you know, that feeling that something is wrong, trust that there's something wrong. Whatever it is, trust that feeling. And we don't do that. I think we have to get to a point to where we're trusting what we're feeling and not second doubt, not second guessing. Because I truly, I truly believe that God, that is your God sense advising you. That's that spirit telling you, go yet, go right, go left, go forward, stop, move, right? Um, but we're so... We're so um, engaged, right, that, we, that, we, that we, we tend to look at other people for validation. You have to love yourself. And I say go within so you don't have to go without, right? Go within so you don't have to go without. Because what you need is in you. It's in, it's in you. You know, we, we are all divine. We're all divine. And so look there first. And if you see something that you think is wrong, trust that. Trust that. Wow. See, guys, this she's giving us gold right here. Like, we could definitely use these words of advice. I will continue to say you are blessed in every way. Um, we are all blessed. I can see the love hearts are flying around. Everybody is yeah, <laughs> taking in what you're saying right now. They mm -hmm. are intrigued and are, are in tune with you. Um, I did want to say if anybody had any questions, um, only if you're comfortable to ask, answer anything. Um, yes, I love questions. Okay, cool. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you guys have any questions, do please send them through and um, I'll read it out for her to, to answer. Okay, one question we've got. First question is, how were black and white people cohabiting inside that cult? Well, um, basically it was supposed to be, everyone was supposed to be equal, which wasn't the case. As I mentioned, the hierarchy was white. Um, and so there were people that, there were people that actually were racist, but Jim gave them something that they needed. It's an amazing um, dynamic, it really is. But we had interracial marriages. People were together. You know, white folks said, oh, you know, we love you. Um, um, sometimes that could have been. We had a lot of white people that were in the Vietnam War. You know, their experiences, too. And people were looking for something different. So we could hope. It wasn't an issue. It really wasn't an issue. We just looked at each other's family. I think everyone just lived in harmony, isn't it? And I think that was that was that something that kind of attracted people to it as well. With, every, with all the chaos going around in America that was like a, a hub in a sense, or correct me if I'm wrong. Well, it was supposed to be a hub, but the thing about it is, is Jim was, Jim was, Jim was criminal in the, in the, in, while he was there, beating people in public, staging fights if people disagreed or, you know, if they fell asleep in, in, in church during a meeting or they didn't go to work or they were, they were insubordinate somewhere. He was, he was so sinister and he was really just a maniac. But that's what I mean. So at what point, when you're signing blank pieces of paper yeah. that they can use to incriminate you if you leave the church, it was, so it's a lot of fear too. So what wasn't in, what wasn't there that still allowed people to, to, to fear for their, to fear for their life, but you're in the United States, you see? Exactly. So it was on the inside. I mean, on the outside, it looked perfect. You know, we had, we had, you know, Congressmen coming, governors coming, mayors coming, visiting political figures, and it looked perfect. You know when they when when the when the shade was on, 
Mm-hmm. And once they left, there was times when they wouldn't, they would not allow people in the meetings on certain nights because it was going to be that explosive. Wow. I think they, so people compromised. They compromised. They, com- they compromised, basically. So much. So much. So much. Because that little piece that was that that held them there, even though they knew, I cannot believe people that my mother included did not know something was wrong. But what was missing? So he, there was a gap. There was a hole that was filled, and with it came nine hundred eighteen people dead in the jungle. It's so scary because at that age of thirteen, you don't even have a choice yet because you would go where your parents go. I remember going to church at that age and. I would go wherever my mum went. So at that exactly, age, you wouldn't even have a voice, even if you felt some type of way. Who are you to even say this is a church, this is a good church or not? Um, right. So I can I can imagine how how you would have felt as as a little girl. Um, another question I've got for you is: someone has asked, mm-hmm. were Guyanese people actually allowed in, or was it just the people that came came over with Jim that were allowed in people's temple? Um, you mean into Jonestown? Yes. Who was allowed into Jones? Only yeah. the only the people that only the community, um, only the members. So Guyanese, right. the community weren't allowed in. Well, they had some. They they had worked with the community before before Jonestown was actually built to its full you know potential basically. So there were some Amerindians that were able to come in. There were some kids that went to school. Um, they came in for medical care, but as far as living there, maybe maybe two, maybe two. Okay. Um, another question I've got for you is: Have you ever considered moving to Africa? Visiting Africa, or moving to Africa? Are you kidding me? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just that we have must, to ask. You, some people. Were you on my internet them. last night watching me watching me search? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually I want to go back. I want to go for the to Ghana. So to for Ghana, my 65th birthday. Yes, God willing, 65, I'm going to make that trip with my children. Amen, and hopefully that will come to pass. I was literally about to ask, where would you go? I was hoping you would say Nigeria, but Ghana Mm. is our brother Mm -hmm. and sister as well, so they are equally, equally as favoured. You're so sweet. (laughs) Well, maybe Nigeria might be a month trip, let's see. Oh, that would be wonderful if you could. That would be wonderful. I know we would accept you with open arms. Mm, um, so sweet. Another question I have for you. Um, just looking. Would you accept religion over culture slash tradition? Hmm. Would I accept religion over culture slash tradition? Well, I'm a I'm an African American, um, and so it's been a difficult road for us because of what we were given, right? What we were given when we were brought over here in shackles. So I don't I don't I think tradition, our culture is African American culture. We I you know when I was Muslim, I wore you know a lot of garb. I think I'm conscious, so I'm not clear. I mean, we we have been so stripped, so we've de- we developed our own culture. Our tradition, our tradition is what was given to us. You know, Juneteenth is on the nineteenth. That's that's a big day for for Black folks in the United States. That's when we were they made it to Texas and they were, we were granted our freedom as slaves. So our traditions and culture are not like those from 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 folks you know from folks from Africa. We weren't. We had to create our own. You see, and so, you know, sometimes we talk about leaving. It's like, no, you know, I'm not leaving. They still, we're we're waiting for the 40 acres and a mule that was promised, you know? So part of me says, yes, let's go. Let me go to another country and help. There's so much work to be done here for my, for my legacy, for my grandchildren. You see? I understand completely. And it makes sense. It does make sense. But you know, it's it's having that idea that Africa is home as well, um, and I think that Absolutely. is what people are, are starting to come to to, to terms with. Right? Right. Yeah, right. because when you're told that you're not wanted, I mean, some guy gave my granddaughter who's sixteen the finger 
for nothing, just drove by and gave her and gave her the finger, you know. Um, so we're living in a tr turbulent time, but there's work to be done here. Now, when I, you know, when, when a lot of work is done, I think I can see I might move, but I have work to do. I have work to do in the United States. Definitely. I, 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 I did have the opportunity to actually be blessed with another cult survivor who went by the name of Vincent, and he mm -hmm. had a lot of things that he said and, you know, educated us. So he's actually asked a question, and he's basically said, have you helped to deprogram people who are in cults since you have survived? And have you become a deprogrammer? Good question. No, I haven't actually deprogrammed. I've met with, I've met a couple of families that have reached out, um, wanting me to see if in fact they're, the group that their kids are in or a family member is in is considered cult, cultish, cult-like. Um, and I dealt with a family that was a major uh, cult down south, I work with them. The daughter just, they couldn't get her out. But no, I have not. I'm not a deprogrammer. That's fine. But I'm open when people, when people call. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, you can obviously offer, as, you can only offer as much as you can give in your capacity anyways. So mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll be blessed to even just hear your voice in a sense and just even connect um, in general. Um, another question someone's got is, have you connected with other survivors since it happened? And if so, how was the reunion? Well, so that's a, you know, I did not for 20 years. I, I didn't deal with anybody. Okay. And then I had um, a friend. And, um, and then I started doing, trying to, there's not a lot of me left. So when I say me, I'm one of the field ones, right? I'm, I'm like one of the peons. I'm like the resistance. So those that survived were not in my category. Um, those that, though, a lot that survived were in the hierarchy, right? They weren't in Jonestown because there's only 30, 30 of us walked out of Jonestown that day. 11 black folks, I'm sorry, 12 black folks, and the rest were Caucasian. So, and those that were in town um, were basically working. They didn't want to be in Jonestown, but they didn't want to say, tell anybody what was going on, right? Mm -hmm. So, no, I tried to, I tried to interact and I just found, I just found this lack of, um, you know, um, how do I want to put it? I've forgiven them. I have those that didn't say anything. I just choose that we're not on the same page in a lot of ways. So I tried, and I feel like there's only one other person I deal with, and that's Yolanda Williams. She's a, a police chief in San Francisco. Um, that's my girl. Yeah. Other than that, no, not anymore. Wow. I, was dumb, I was dumbfounded because one of the security said, which, you know, Jim was so bad off, so filled with drugs and alcohol, that they had to help him to pee, to urinate. And I said, and you knew all this and you didn't say anything? You see, so that was what I was dealing with. The, those that knew and were very complicit and never said a word. And so that's... Did people actually get to meet him on a one-to-one -one basis? Like, could you say you actually knew him? Or was it just that he was from afar? I wouldn't say new because, see, so here's another. So Jim told us, I'm 13, that he could read our minds. And so you didn't want him close to you because you thought he could read your mind. I know it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And so my interaction with him was minimal. I mean, he yelled at me once and then he praised me once, you know. Um, and uh, But I stayed away. I didn't want to be close to him. So some people did that needed that, that you know, energy or needed that attention. I wasn't one of those people. You won't see any pictures of me in Jonestown. Pretty much, I was just, mm -mm, no, trying to stay in the back, in the in the back, not to be seen. Wow, I can imagine. Um, I've had someone ask a question saying, "Did anyone who survived fake drunk?" The purple Kool-Aid. Did anyone that's did anyone that drank the concussion survive at all? No. Nobody. So that goes that question there. Oh wait, what happened? 
Oh, we lost her. We lost her. But she'll be back. Um, in the meantime, um, we've had a lot. Um, we've had her go through her story. We've had her talk about the indicators. I wanted her to talk about her book to end it off. Um, and then we can wrap it up. But I think her book will be the icing on the cake in terms of the message. Um, so if we can get her back in to literally just talk about the book. Um, it would be wonderful. Oh, see if I find her. One second, guys. Ah, oh, yes, got her. I think the connection must have gone but she is back in um oh sorry no it's okay i was thinking that the reception or the connectivity must have just dropped a little um but we still have everybody here so thank you for mm. coming back on um i was literally just i wanted to talk to you i know i remembered you here i heard you say about your book so i literally mm -hmm. just wanted you to go over um when you released it where can we find the book and mm -hmm. what details can we also get just a little few details from the book as well sure so the book is titled slavery and faith um it was released in 2009 it's still on amazon it's self-published it's still selling um so you can buy it on amazon is basically where most people buy it um and so the book was my the book was my um my it was very cathartic for me i was able to you know it took me eight years the original book was over 400 pages and i cut it down to over a little over two but it helped me i was i wasn't sure if i was going to publish but i wanted to tell the story i said if nothing else if i leave this earth today i need to have an account of what happened so in the book is basically my my childhood you know um being in people's temple being in jonestown and then the hell that I suffered when I came back, um, because here's a here's a woman, 22, uh, lost everything, and had no one to didn't trust anyone, was confused and lost and damaged, and I think I had the sign on my head that said damaged, damaged, right, naive, vulnerable, and so I went through a lot, you know, um, drug drug addiction for six months of hell, right. Um, because I was, I was trying to numb the pain and I, I, I couldn't find a way just to, I, I didn't want to see 900 dead bodies anymore. I wanted to just pretend that it didn't happen. So I lived in denial for years. You know, I didn't admit that my parents, I didn't, re I didn't really acknowledge that they passed probably 10, 10 or so years afterward. I was still looking for someone. Maybe they, maybe they went to Venezuela and they have amnesia and they'll show up. I mean, I went through life in a fog, you know, but working every day functional, right? But inside, I, my heart was broken into a million little pieces. I was, just, I was a shell of a person. I suffered from PTSD, you know, um, survivor's guilt. And, but how I got back is I, I made a commitment that I said, when I hit 50, which I never thought I'd see 50, I said, my life is on the way out. So what do I need to do? I had to, I had to get my spiritual house in order. You know, my soul was crying. You have to acknowledge who, who he is. You have to acknowledge that you didn't do this by yourself. And so that, that transition, that, that challenge was, was really started in 2007. I mean, I left my husband. I got a divorce because he, I couldn't get him on board and because I knew this, had, this book had to be done. I needed to connect with my Savior. I had to. It was, that was my, that was my, my life room. And that, that's, that's it. You know, that's, that's part of the book. That's, that's the journey. And more. You know, there's another one that's going to come out because I learned so much more since then. You know, but I, I'm just a walk. I'm blessed. And I'm grateful. And I think we need to be grateful for everything. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful.
I'm grateful. Wow. Um, please, I know everybody was asking for the name of your book. We will definitely get details from you so that we can do a few posts so that people can um, go and find the book. Is it available on Amazon or, or anything? It's, it's basically on Amazon. It's Slavery of Faith. Uh, yeah. That's the name. And um, it's still available, last I checked. <laughs> Perfect. So, guys, I will definitely be putting out a few posts in regards to where you can find the book, the title of the book, if you didn't catch it here as well. Um, it's called Slavery of Faith. Slavery of Faith um god i can't i don't even know what to even say i just want to thank you um so much mm -hmm. is there anything that you wanted to kind of leave us with before we kind of end our discussion today i want you all to remain blessed and remember who god is um god is love share that every day um, make a difference make a difference i think we are here to serve and that's what that's where we need to be so God bless you all. Thank you so much for having me. Let me know when you want me back. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank you. Going on. Bye. So guys, that was Leslie Wagner Wilson. You guys can follow her on Instagram. Um, if you guys want to shoot her a question, as you can see, she's more than happy to connect with anybody that wants to connect with her. Um, her book, if you guys didn't catch that, um, we will definitely be putting the details of it once I come off. As again, thank you for joining me. My name's Jessica and I'm one of the presenters over Africa X5. Take care and I'll see you guys next week.